Welcome. I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Harvard professor Arthur Brooks knows a thing or two about happiness. In fact, he teaches happiness, how to find it and how to live it. He teamed up with one of his biggest fans, Oprah Winfrey, to co-author a book offering a blueprint for being happier. Nora O'Donnell caught up with them. I'm going to tick off a few things that people may associate with happiness. So you tell me yes or no if okay. they are necessary for a happy life. Money. No. Fame. No, no, double no. Power. No. Good looks. Nope. None of them. None of them. None of them. But if you were an alien right. and landed yeah. on Earth, and specifically in America, and looked at social media, you would think that the way to happiness is money, fame, power, and good looks. Yeah, social media is this laboratory for the earthly goals that actually make you miserable. Later in the show, Arthur Brooks says he can't take credit for the book idea. So who came up with writing the book? That was Oprah's idea to write the book. And I write books, you know, for a living. Every two or three mm -hmm. years, I write a book. And, and she co-authors occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but her idea for the book was unique, which was, she said to me, she said, look, um, you know I had a show. And I said, yes, I know you had a show. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in the universe knows you had a show. For many people, sharing a meal with family and friends is a source of happiness. Our Califasane learned how the weekly Italian tradition of Sunday sauce brings everyone to the table. I think in its sort of philosophical form, it's this pot of tomato sauce as the fireplace around what you gather mm. your friends and family around. Um, and into that sauce can go meatballs or brajol or Uncle Tony or anybody goes in the sauce. It's really just a, a tool to feed your family, but also to bring everyone mm. to the table. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Could there be a simple key to happiness? Author and professor Arthur Brooks thinks so. He partnered on a book with friend and student Oprah Winfrey, who observed the pursuit of happiness for 25 years at her talk show. As Nora O'Donnell learned, happiness isn't so much about what you have, but what you have within. How long have human beings been chasing happiness? How long have human beings been walking the earth? <laughs> Arthur Brooks' life mission is sharing what he's learned about happiness with the world. In fact, it's what the Harvard professor is paid to do. So your day job is teaching happiness at Harvard. Yeah. How did that get on the syllabus? <laughs> <laughs> the secret to happiness is actually teaching happiness. That's the reason I do it is because it's, I mean, it's not research, it's me-search. To his great surprise, his lessons reached far beyond the classroom to include one star student. How did you find Arthur Brooks? During the pandemic, I was in search of fuel to keep myself inspired, to keep myself open to possibility, to keep myself hopeful. I started reading his column in The Atlantic and then looking more and more forward to that column on how to build life. So that's when Oprah Winfrey decided to personally reach out to Arthur Brooks. The first time you picked up the phone and you hear a voice on the other line say, this is Oprah, what did you think? Uh, well, I said, yeah, and I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> but it was no, Oprah, actually. and she invited him over for dinner. And I'm thinking, what happened to my life? You know, I'm just a college professor who fell off the turnip truck in front of Oprah Winfrey's tea house. He is the perfect person to have for dinner because you just probe his brain yeah. about all the things you've ever wanted to ask about your own emotions and um, searching for happiness and well-being and all of that. So I am the kind of person, as you know, that believes that life is better when you share it, whether that's bread or information. To share that information, they hatched a plan to co-author a book. Pretty nice when Oprah says, let's write a book together. It's not the worst thing that can happen to you <laughs> in your life as an author, that's for sure. <laughs> the book builds itself as a guide to getting happier, and the formula is not what you might think. I'm going to tick off a few things that people may associate with happiness. So you tell me yes or no if okay. they are necessary for a happy life. Money. No. Fame. No, no, double no. Power. 
No. Good looks. Nope. None of them. None of them. None of them. But if you were an alien right. and landed yeah. on Earth, and specifically in America, and looked at social media, you would think that the way to happiness is money, fame, power, and good looks. Yeah, social media is this laboratory for the earthly goals that actually make you miserable. Everybody is looking at other people's social media, what they believe to be other people's lives, which is only a snapshot of other people's lives, and feeling envy about that. And one of the things that Arthur and I talk about in this book is that envy is the great destroyer. The happiness killer. It is the happiness killer. Oprah says she's had a front row seat to people's quest for happiness after 25 years on TV, interviewing more than 37,000 people. Every day, I would sit and talk with the audience. And most people would always just say, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Well, what does that look like? Define it. Define, Define it. happiness. Define it. What I realize is that most people have never defined it. And then they'd say, well, I want my kids to be happy. Well, that's your kids, but what do you want? And so being able to answer specifically what that looks like for you is the beginning of being happier. All happiness is a combination of enjoyment, satisfaction, and meaning. That's what we need. We need to enjoy our lives, which is not the same thing as pleasure. You know, the pursuit of pleasure will lead you to addiction and misery. Enjoyment adds in people and memories, which is the reason that beer ads never have a guy alone pounding a 12 pack in his apartment, <laughs> but rather they have him with friends because <laughs> they want it to be the source of enjoyment. Satisfaction is the joy that we get after a struggle because humans are made to struggle and to achieve. And meaning is the hardest one. Meaning is the sense of coherence. You know, things happen for a reason. Direction and purpose. There's a reason for the things that are happening in my life, and, and there's a reason for my life. What makes you happy in daily life? So, 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 so many things. Nature makes me joyous and so much happier. Along with nature walks, Oprah also loves bread. Oh my God, what? Bread! <laughs> Which is why we met her at the Amy's Bread Cafe in the Museum of the City of New York. Olive fresh baked is always my favorite. Any of that here? I know, right here. Okay, wow. As for Arthur's happy place, it's the gym in his basement, where you'll find him every day at 5 a.m. You measure out your uh, yeah. coffee yeah. rounds out the morning ritual. How much is habit? important in happiness? It's important to actually have, to, to have a routine for what you're trying to do to set your day up in the right way. Structuring your day is critically important. Another thing that's important, accepting unhappiness as part of life. The truth is all of us have suffering in our lives. The job is not to eradicate the suffering, it is to grow and learn from the suffering because it is part of our life's journey. That is part of what it means to be fully alive. You can't be happy unless you're also unhappy. You cannot control all of the external circumstances in your life, but you can control how you feel about those circumstances in your life. It boils down to the th thing that I do when I go to teach in South Africa to my girls. I always teach a class called Life 101. And at the end of that class, I leave them with the poem Invictus. The last lines are, I'm the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. And so taking control of your emotions and not allowing your emotions to control you, taking the wheel, allows you to be the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. I love Invictus, and if I had on short sleeve shirts, you would see my goosebumps. <laughs> really? <laughs> Oprah and Arthur have charted a course for happiness, and what seems to make them happiest is teaching others all about it. Any standout memories from writing the book together? Well, everything with Oprah Winfrey is a standout memory. I mean, it's a... <laughs> Arthur says, you make him happy. Does he make you happy? He makes me happy. I just look at his bald head and I just get happy. I look at that <laughs> peanut head and I just <laughs> makes me smile. <laughs> Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Arthur Brooks and Oprah Winfrey, something you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. I immediately would ask, 
sometimes out loud, but certainly in my own conscious spirit, what is this here to teach me? As promised, here's more from Nora O'Donnell, Arthur Brooks, and Oprah Winfrey. Oprah said of you, he's part of my tribe. Yeah. Was it like an instant connection? Totally. From the very beginning, total spark. Because she sees the world the way that I do, which is that everybody, there's two kinds of people. There are people who have found the secret to living a better life and the people who haven't found the secret yet. But That's, are searching for it. Totally, everybody wants it. Some people act like they don't want to be happier, but everybody wants to be happier. And that means everybody has the potential to actually lead better lives. So we'd explain that. What is it that makes you and Oprah part of the same tribe, on the same wavelength? Uh, we both have a personal mission to lift people up and bring them together. That's why we were born. That's why we're on the earth, is to lift people up and bring them together. That's, and, and then we do it in different ways because we all have different gifts. You know, for me, it's, you know, I'm, a, I'm a social scientist. You know, I've been incredibly blessed to do the things that I do. Um, you know, I, I don't take it for granted. A position as a professor at Harvard University is a pretty great platform. And writing for The Atlantic, I can talk to a lot of people. Oprah, on the other hand, is conscious every day of the responsibility that comes with the privilege of being somebody who has the confidence of, of hundreds of millions of people around the world. And we're trying to use these platforms to lift people up and bring them together. We both believe that we were born for that reason, and that's the connection that we have. You write, one must recognize that the person in control of your happiness is and forever will yeah. be you. Yeah. Part of I, the reason for me, a light bulb moment in reading your book was, I think part of the reason we're in a happiness slump is, as you mentioned, envy. Envy. But it's also this idea that, well, I didn't marry the right person, or I have the wrong job, mm -hmm. or I experienced something traumatic as a childhood, which are all uh, legitimate feelings. Mm -hmm. But those are things that happen to, to you. us. Yeah. And I wonder, how would you advise, given everything that you've been through in your life and mm -hmm. talked about in your childhood, how does one take agency mm. over their life and their happiness? Oh, I love this question. Um, I know this, that many of the things that have happened to you have also happened for you. And that I learned, mm, I don't know, somewhere in the 90s, to ask the question when the crisis or the challenge showed up for me, I immediately would ask, sometimes out loud, but certainly in my own conscious spirit, what is this here to teach me? And that is a thing I do no matter what. I mean, if I'm going through a crisis or there's any kind of challenge that shows up or a difficulty or thing, the first thing I, well, okay, what is this here to show me? What is this here to teach me? And how can I get that lesson as soon as possible? And this, I guarantee you, the moment you have the conscious realization of, oh, this is why this is here, showing up to allow me to see whatever that is in your life, mm -hmm. it changes for you. Mm -hmm. Unhappiness is not the enemy. No, it is not the enemy. The unhappiness, and if actually one of the things that's so powerful, I think about uh, what Arthur has written specifically is about how your emotions are there to allow you to feel the feel and then take the wheel of this feeling that I'm having. I'm having this feeling and now I need to do what? And not to allow yourself to be overcome by the feeling. So you have a feeling of anger, you have a feeling of sadness, you have a feeling of disappointment. Doesn't mean you are those things, you are those emotions. So who came up with writing the book? That was Oprah's idea to write the book. And I write books you know, for a living. Every two or three mm -hmm. years I write a book. And, and she co-authors occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but her idea for the book was unique, which was she said to me, she said, look, um, you know I had a show. And I said, yes, I know you had a show. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in the universe knows you had a show. She says, I don't have the show now, but we can do something like the same thing, where if I still had my show, I'd have you on 25 or 30 times to talk about the science of happiness. And that would launch this into the public consciousness. So let's do something like that, where we are having a, a serious conversation about this thing that you specialize in. And I can talk about how I've experienced it in my own life and in my own career. And we can bring it to people in these 
brand new ways, the same way that we would if I had my show, and that's how we wrote the book. So it was wonderful. It was just a completely new experience. I've never written a book like this before in my life. You wrote in the book that the heart of the Oprah Winfrey show was that it was a classroom. Mm, yeah. And I think the heart of me is really a teacher. You know, when I ended the show, that's one of the things that I understood about what that moment in time had been for me, mm -hmm. that I had spent so much of my life thinking, oh, I had always wanted to be a fourth grade teacher because of Mrs. Duncan, mm -hmm. um, who was so inspiring to me, was the first teacher who actually saw me. And I think the most valuable gift you can give to anybody is to let them know that they are seen. Mm -hmm. That is why I see you in so many um, languages is a greeting, you know, Sayabona um, in South Africa. So I think that this whole idea of letting a person know that they matter and that they are fully, um, that one of the big lessons I learned from the show was this, that after every conversation, no matter who it was, in one form or another, that person would say, how was that? Was that okay? Mm -hmm. That happened the first time Beyonce taught me to twerk. Yes. At the end of it, she handed me the mic and she goes, was that okay? I went, you're Beyonce, it's very much okay. And so what I started to see was that there, there was this thread that connected um, all of the conversations and that what people were really saying, they were looking for a validation, like, was that all right? Did you hear me? And did what I say matter? And I just could tell you, at, after every interview, I'm sure it happens to you in one mm -hmm. form or another, a person, the yeah. people are looking to say, was that okay? And so what I learned is that there, there's a, the common denominator in our human experience is did you see me, did you hear me, and did what I say mean anything to you? Mm -hmm. And so being able to give that to people is such a gift. Up next, it's all in the sauce. Welcome back. Sunday sauce is a weekly ritual for many Italian-American families. For world-renowned chef Mario Carbone, cooking started off as a family affair. He's perfected his own recipe for Sunday sauce for his restaurants and commercial sauce line. Calafasane got a taste of what it's all about. Come over here, kid, learn something. It's a recipe that was written into the script of The Godfather. You start out with a little bit of oil, and you fry some garlic. Then you throw in some tomatoes, some tomato paste, you fry it, you make sure it doesn't stick. You got it to a boil, you shove in all your sausage and your meatballs. Huh? Sunday sauce, as it's called, simmers for hours. For generations of Italian-American families, it's been a tradition and sometimes a temptation. It's just sort of stewing slowly on the back of the stove for invariably a couple of hours while you try to like grab a piece of bread and steal some sauce out of it. I really didn't start cooking in the kitchen with my family until I did it with um, my mother's parents, my grandparents okay. who were born in Italy. Chef Mario Carbone says the secret ingredient is people. I think in its sort of philosophical form, it's this pot of tomato sauce as the fireplace around what you gather mm. your friends and family around. Um, and into that sauce can go meatballs or brajol or Uncle Tony or anybody goes in the sauce. It's really just a, a tool to feed your family but also to bring everyone mm. to the table. The next thing I'm gonna put in is a little bit of tomato paste. Tomato paste. Yeah. Getting everybody to the table at Carbone, his namesake restaurant in New York's Greenwich Village, isn't easy. You've had President Obama eating here. Yeah. You've had, uh, I heard Justin Bieber was once turned away here. He did not have a reservation. Yeah, not exactly the story, <laughs> but you know, you know how the press goes with that. We love Justin and Haley, they're, they're regulars. Is this a red sauce restaurant? Yeah, absolutely, we're, we're a red sauce joint. There are many red sauces served at Carbone, which also has locations in Dallas, Miami, Las Vegas, and Hong Kong. Mario Carbone says the restaurant's meat sauce is the closest to the one his mom makes. But mine is a little bit more complex. His version includes ground beef, ground, ground veal, veal and, sausage. instead of ground pork, pork sausage. The veal is the lighter pink, the beef is the darker pink, and why do you use the sausage instead of the pork? You can almost smell the why right now. I mean, it's reminiscent of, of the stewed sausage that often goes in Sunday sauce. Mm -hmm. 
Come Sunday. Somehow it all gets back to me working. <laughs> but you do it These so well. Yeah, we don't want to take the job true. away. You're the expert. Yeah. The Carbone family gathers for a feast, usually cooked by Maria Carbone. <laughs> Who's in charge today? My mother's in charge. <laughs> And where did you learn your recipe? Uh, from my parents. Did you do it a little different from how they did it, or no, did you try to did. follow exactly I, I the same? I it. I did follow it. Mario does it a little bit differently. Maria Carbone makes her sauce from scratch. At least she used to. So in the old days, she would stew this with cans of tomatoes. Yeah, tomatoes. But, but you're opening up a jar of tomato of pasta sauce. House branded. I've got to think, in your day, you weren't using no. something from no. a jar. No, absolutely not. It's a little different when it's your son's jar. When it has the name Carbone, absolutely. <laughs> so here's the pasta going in. But does the family approve? How's this Sunday sauce coming along? It's delicious. What can I say? <laughs> I think you could still claim some credit for that sauce. I think so, right? He couldn't have done it without you. This is true. <laughs> Technically true. <laughs> this is true. We like to cook together. Looks good, smells good. We're ready for dinner. Well, Mary, you did a good job. Yeah, delicious. Really really and mom. And mom. <laughs> Maria. For Mario Carbone, red sauce is serious business. Except Absolutely. when it's not. Can we have Absolutely. a check, please? <laughs> no check, family. Oh, it's free? Yeah. Huh, nice. It's like yeah, when we go to the restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> what did you ask Ricky for? I said, send me something that I never had before. I told him to send me the check. <laughs> I'm going to send, yeah. to send him the check. <laughs>